Hey guys, welcome to another lecture. Um, this one is going to fall under neuro, and this one is specifically on meningitis and encephalitis. So we'll always approach this objectively. What is it? Uh, how do we identify it? How does the patient present symptomatically? You know, how do we diagnose it definitively, and what do we do about it? And of course, how can we prevent it? So what is meningitis? And just like the name suggests, it's an inflammation of the meninge meninges which is the covering of the brain, which it makes up the a pia mater, dura mater, the arachnoid. Uh, bacterial and viral organisms are the most, are the most, uh, are the biggest culprits, although protozoal and fungal uh, meningitis can also occur. Um, viral, viral is oftentimes associated with a, a name called sterile or, um, well, sterile meningitis, and it is the most common viral meningitis, and it is uh, treated symptomatically and usually runs its course without any, any real complication. Bacterial is the one that we really look out for because this, uh, this is associated with a high mortality rate if not caught early and treated early. Cancers and some other drugs can cause uh, meningitis as well, most notably NSAIDs, antibiotics, and IV immunoglobulins. Direct routes of entry include brain surgery, brain and trading skull injury, basal or skull fracture, anytime that the skull gets uh, compromised and, and microbes or microorganisms can, can enter into that space. Regardless of the cause of meningitis, the symptoms are very similar. We're going to see that classic presentation. We'll talk about that in a bit here. Prognosis for the patient, as mentioned earlier, is very well, excuse me, are very good if, if caught early and treated early. However, mortality in untreated uh, meningitis is pretty high, 70 to 100 percent. So what types are there? There's bacterial, viral, and other. And the other is the protozoal and the parasites and stuff like that, which is very rare, pretty obscure, but it does happen. So bacterial meningitis is the one that they've been making public service announcements for in the past five to ten years, especially for vulnerable populations like teenagers, and they were really pushing for uh, teenagers to get uh, vaccinated. And that was mainly for the um, meningococcal meningitis, which is associated with a high mortality rate. But as we can see, there's some, there's some, uh, you know, usual suspects here that cause other kind of uh, clinical presentations and complications that you would not think are associated with bacterial meningitis, but they are like strep, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae, E. coli, um, influenza. H influenza, you know, so these are things we got to be look, we got to look out for. Uh, usual cause of meningitis is secondary to another bacterial, excuse me guys, sorry guys, that was my son. So uh, it's usually secondary to another bacterial infection, such as pneumonia, empyema. You guys remember what empyema is? It's that um, kind of viscous, white pus-like pneumonia, osteomyelitis, otitis media, sinusitis, encephalitis, upper respiratory infections. And if you kind of look at this, it's kind of like an ENT entry, right? Like the uh, um, ears, nose, and throat entry because those bacteria colonize in, in these kind of um, reservoirs such as our, our nares and our ears and, and they, um, they colonize and get, you know, uh, enough where they're able to penetrate into the bloodstream. And then from the bloodstream, they pass these semi-permeable structures that lead to the um, brain and CSF. Viral is the most common type of meningitis, as I mentioned previously, also called aseptic meningitis, because typically no organisms are isolated from CSF cultures. So um, again, aseptic and uh, sterile meningitis are gonna be synonymous terms. So if I use those interchangeably, don't get confused. Um, it's really just this kind of umbrella term that means not bacterial. So. For all intents and purposes, that could mean that the protozoal and paras uh, parasite and fungal ones can fall under viral. However, it's most often associated with just viral. Uh, so again, um, the sterile or the um, the, the sterile uh, meningitis is usually associated with viral, uh, meaning not bacterial. Let's see, so common viral organisms that cause meningitis are enterovirus, herpes simplex virus 2, varicella zoster virus, uh, mumps, and HIV. And you can kind of guess, like, just 
based on these disease processes and these viral bacteria, not bacteria, sorry, viruses, how do, how do they enter the CSF? And usually it's through axons or neuro, um, like the neural pathways, because, um, you know, a lot of these things lie do do dormant in the nervous tissue. So then we have fungal. Uh, uh, one of the major or the heavy hitter, hitters for fungal is cryptococcus neoformans. Uh, is the most common that affects CNS of patients with AIDS. Fulminant invasive sinusitis also cause fungal meningitis. And there's also protozoal and parasitic. So who gets this? Like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's usually young people and that's why they were really encouraging them to get vaccinated for that. Uh, it's usually people ages 16 to 21 years old have the highest rates of infection from life-threatening and meningitis, meningitis, right? Um, and uh, men are in the meningo meningococcal infection. Um, so what are we talking about? Uh, 16, 21 year olds uh, constantly in some sort of school environment or, um, you know, like camps or, uh, you know, juvenile hall, prisons, um, things like that. People that are, that are around each other in close quarters, um, you know, you could see young Marines and soldiers and, and, and seamen being um, exposed to this kind of environment and how it could spread really easy. The CDC re recommends meningococcal vaccine between ages 11 and 12 and a booster again at 16 years. Adults living in military barracks, group homes, college dorms, prisons, etc. Cruise ships, which is one we don't think about too often, but it's, you know, uh, short lived um, close quarters. Uh, traveling or residing in countries where disease is common, and that's Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rates. And, um, you know, uh, everybody's like, what is the Sub-Saharan Africa uh, region? And that's basically anything but the, the, the uppermost states of Africa. I think that the uppermost states are like Egypt, Libya, Morocco. There's like five of them, and everything else is called Sub-Sahara, and it's just um, separated by the Saharan Desert there. So signs and symptoms to look for. So this is us as a nurse trying to recognize these classic signs and symptoms or the more obscure and being hip to the skip and saying, OK, this actually looks kind of suspect. Let's um, let's put these guys in uh, some sort of isolation. Let's make sure I have the proper PPE on. Let's make sure that we we educate the family when they come in and out. Um, so this is what we we're going to look for. We're going to look for that decreased level of consciousness, which in in itself or by itself might not be uh, really uh, connected with meningitis, but we'll, we might see them disoriented to person, place, and time. People reaction and eye movements, photophobia, nystagmus, which is involuntary eye movement, motor responses. They're normal early in the disease process, but might cause hemiparesis or hemiplegia and decrease muscle tone as the disease um, progresses. Remember the difference paresis versus palesia, right? Paresis meaning weakness, literally, and palesia meaning uh, paralysis, right? Uh, cranial nerve dysfunction, uh, sometimes seizure activity, low blood pressure if SIRS is present, right? So what is SIRS? Uh, there's, it's an inflammatory response uh, syndrome, right? So we have um, increased heart rate, um, increased temperature, um, inc increased white blood cells, uh, what else is SIRS, um, respiratory rate, um, and really SIRS is only SIRS if there's two or more of those present, or in white blood cell count, if there's two or more of those present with a source, right? So maybe this person had um, some sort of upper respiratory infection, so there's the source, and they have uh, increased respiratory rate and temperature or increased respiratory rate and um, heart rate, right? So that is our two, our two SIRS criteria with the source. And we know that, you know, those URI kind of symptoms and, and some of those viruses can cause, and bacteria can cause um, meningitis. What else are we gonna look out for? Memory change, short-term memory, uh, you know, uh, attention span is, is um, is uh, affected personality behavior changes like irritability, uh, bewilderment, 
severe headaches, generalized muscle aches, nausea and vomiting, fever and chills, tachycardia, red or purplish macular rash. Okay, there's something that, you know, might be pretty specific. Nuchal rigidity and neck stiffness. Okay, so this is that classic presentation, right? As there's, as, uh, you know, part of that area is becoming inflamed and it's causing some, um, you know, with um, movement of the neck, which houses the the brainstem and, and everything else is kind of um, just just kind of inflamed and irritated right now. And as we push our, or we try to bring our chin to our chest, it can be very, very painful and uncomfortable. Hydrocephalus and urinary incontinence is also some other symptoms we could look for. So how to diagnose it? We have to do an analysis of cerebral spinal fluid um, primarily to rule out bacterial meningitis. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to do a spinal tap or a lumbar, lumbar puncture. And I want you guys to look this up a little bit in terms of positioning, in terms of recovery for the patient, in terms of what they can expect, um, what uh, complications can go on. What do you think? Uh, complicate what kind of complications can occur if we're putting a long skinny needle literally into someone's spine to drain some cerebral spinal fluid there's definitely some some risk factors that go with that in terms of infection in terms of paresis or paralysis in terms of pain in terms of CSF leakage etc so there's going to be some recovery in terms of what position does that patient have to lie in or obviously I just gave it away and <laughs> they'll be lying down uh, flat for how how long after the procedure. So uh, we're going to analyze the CSF for cell count, differential count, and proteins. Glucose concentrations are determined and culture sensitivity and gram stain studies are performed. Uh, we might, you know, if we if we take a look back at those, um, the, the symptomatic presentation, we see the decreased level of consciousness and disorientation and those all those neuro symptoms we could very well think you know stroke or we might think uh, some sort of head injury or or something so we might do this ct here to rule out um, brain abnormalities or ischemic or or, or um, hemorrhagic stroke right or any other brain uh, you know abnormalities such as tumors or masses etc uh, we're going to do blood cultures uh, because uh, we're going to see if the infection has reached a bloodstream, right? So we're always looking for septicemia or bacteremia. Uh, there's something called counterimmunoelectrophoresis, which is not, um, I don't know how, how, how much that's done or how often that's done, but it detects the presence of protozoa or viruses in CSF uh, more readily. But for the most part, unless they have more complications, I don't think they're doing that as often. Typically, we're just ruling out bacterial and we're attributing it to viral. Now, if the patient persists and we, you know, we might have to do some of that more obscure, those more obscure studies to kind of check for the protozoa and stuff like that. Um, so immunoelectrophoresis is kind of just trying to isolate proteins and, and other um, particles. We'll do a CBC. Uh, we'll show the elevated WBC count, you know, but that's... That's just typical if they have that class or those that clinical presentation where we're definitely going to do a CBC and electrolyte panel because we know those kind of things can alter us as well uh, neurologically. Uh, X-ray of the chest and sinuses and mastoids because um, even with sinusitis and mastoiditis, you can have a lot of that clinical presentation that we, we looked at in the last slide. Uh, MRIs may exhibit increased intracranial pressure and or brain abscess. So CSF findings in bacterial versus viral meningitis. So this is important. I want you guys to kind of get this down in terms of, um, at least for bacterial, what what is the CSF going to look like in the lab, you know, or after the lab kind of, um, uh, you know, disarticulates that. Well, first of all, when it comes out, if it's uh, bacterial, it's going to look cloudy or turbid versus viral, that's going to be clear. White blood cells can be increased and viral can be increased. Proteins can be increased in bacterial meningitis or will be uh, increased and uh, viral can be slightly increased or not increased. Glucose will be decreased in bacterial meningitis versus viral where glucose is most often normal but may be decreased. 
Um, CSF pressure will be elevated in bacterial and viral could be normal or elevated. So viral is kind of the more obscure one or the more ambiguous one. Um, but um, for testing purposes, if I did have you guys recognize that, I would be pretty clear where it might say slight increase versus increased. Okay, so that's that's how we'll differentiate it there. So time is brain in all situations, just like time is muscle in all cardiac events. So um, we want to identify these classic signs and symptoms early as the frontline nurse, and we want to communicate as quickly as possible. We want to isolate um, until we get definitive diagnostics, and we want to treat early, right? So we're going to use broad spectrum antibiotics until results of culture and gram stains are available. And just to recap, you know that broad spectrum antibiotics are um, antibiotics that kind of work with a bunch of different systems and they, uh, they kind of, um, they're just kind of like these generalized antibiotics that kind of work for a lot of different systems in, in, in um, uh, bacterial microorganisms until we can more readily def uh, identify some microorganisms and, and if warranted, we'll change to a very specific treatment if necessary. Um, bacterial meningitis usually requires two week course of antibiotics, <clears throat> excuse me, a two week course of antibiotics. Therapy should begin one to two hours after it is prescribed. Uh, we might use mannitol to decrease ICP and mannitol is a form of a diuretic to um, get rid of ICP. So just start looking up mannitol and what are some, what are some nursing implications and some, some nursing care and some side effects, et cetera, that we might have to uh, consider when using mannitol. Uh, we might use antiepileptic agents for seizure activity uh, or to prevent seizure activity. Uh, steroids, especially for S. pneumoniae meningitis. Uh, people in close contact with people who have N. meningitis should be treated prophylactically with rifampin, Cipro, or Rocephin. So again, like let's say that we get this college age student or we get this um, you know, I don't know, Boy Scout that was, you know, went on a week camping trip with the, the rest of his troop. He had N meningitis. Um, the rest of his troop or the rest of the people in that in that dorm might be treated with prof uh, prophylactic rifampin, Cipro, or Rocephin. So again, a good, uh, since we mentioned these medications, a good idea to always look at those medications whenever they're mentioned on PowerPoints and look up um, the stuff that you would need to know if you were using them as a nurse, such as um, side effects, uh, onset peak duration, we want to know about um, nursing implications, uh, all, the, all the heavy hitting information, okay? So how are we caring for someone with meningitis? We're going to maintain ABCs for sure, okay? We're going we're gonna to check vital signs and neuro checks, Q2 to 4 hours or PRN, obviously. Uh, we're going to do a, a cranial nerve assessment to include uh, cranial nerves 3, 4, 6, 7, and 8, and we're going to monitor for changes. So now we know how to quantify those changes more readily with a GCS scale in our alert and orientation model, which is, um, you know, ANO times 4, person, place, time, and event. All right, so if we see a decrease in how many points on a GCS scale, that would uh, warrant a, an immediate call out to the doctor. Did I hear you say two? Yes, you are correct. Two points in a GCS scale. A decrease of two points would warrant a call out to the doctor. Uh, we're going to manage pain with drugs and non-drug methods. Uh, what are some non-drug methods? If you might have some photophobia or some, um, you know, some uh, people that are, you know, easily irritated and, uh, um, you know, things like that. Our loud noises are kind of messing with them and, and exacerbating their pain and, and head pressure. Well, we might decrease the stimuli and other non-pharmacological methods, right? Therapeutic touch, etc. cetera. Uh, INOs, we want to uh, look at those INOs, right? Because that's always a good indicator of uh, the body's ability of perfusion, first and foremost. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to definitely do some INOs. Uh, antibiotics, uh, we're going to be diligent about our antibiotic time. So again, you know, we want to uh, be watching this uh, in terms of duration of the medication. So if it's, you know, has a, a duration of six hours and we're giving it six, a Q six hours or uh, four times a day, 
Uh, but then we want to look as, as we're treating these individuals with antibiotic therapy, you're going to definitely look at, uh, be looking out for those uh, culture studies, right? To make sure that what we're dealing with is indeed bacterial. Um, and it's not something else that's uh, the culprit. So uh, that's happened from time to time is it, it could be it could be viral and we're treating it um, with antibiotics and how effective are antibiotics for viruses or funguses, et cetera. Excuse me. IV fluids is prescribed, of course. OK, uh, we're going to monitor those labs always. Range of motion exercises, Q4 hours, definitely, because these individuals are going to just want to be body's going to be healing they're going to be out of it for you know a little while so we got to make sure that you know everything's moving everything's clicking uh that we're uh you know promoting venous return because our we're not walking around so our gastrox or our calves aren't pushing blood back to through the through the system to be uh reperfused and reoxygenated and blah 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 uh circulating all the good stuff all the all the all the warrior blood cells and everything else so let's get some range of motion exercises going uh prevent any you know atrophy muscle atrophy contractures etc uh, we're going to always assess distal circulation that's always the case always you know because abcs are always our concern so um, distal circulation is a good indicator of of proper perfusion you know uh pulses um radial and pedal most distal of course and cap refill etc uh, skin temperature so we might provide them that low stimulus environment, such as dark and, and quiet room, standard precautions. OK, we're going to use standard precautions. So what um, uh, the so how, how do these how do these uh, organisms get spread in terms of meningitis? Um, they're droplets, you know, so they and, and these droplets or these or these microorganisms can stay viable on inanimate surfaces for a little while. So uh, we might be protecting the, the entries into our body, such as the eyes and the nose and the mouth, right? So um, I would say definitely use a mask with the shield on it or some goggles, a gown, gloves, and hand washing, paramount, in and out. So when do we take off our PPE? Or where do we put on our PPE? And I know this is like standard issue knowledge. You guys are experts at this now, but put it on before you enter the room. Make sure that you're looking at the door jams before you enter the room, just in case that's not your patient in terms of um, patient assignment for the day that you're looking at the door jam. You're saying, OK, oh, this person's fall risk or oh, this person's droplet precautions. Let me go check out what's going down here. So you go to the nurse and you say, hey, nurse, Betty, what's going down? Oh, they have uh, meningitis and um, we think it's bacterial. We're, we're getting it rolled out right now. And they are like, oh, geez, OK, I was about to go take his vital signs for you or do his blood glucose monitoring or whatever it is you're going to do. You make sure you protect yourself, that you're not bringing that, uh, making yourself a victim first and taking uh, some goodies home, you know, to your kids and, and, and husband or wife, right? So we're doing some droplet droplet precautions, okay? <clears throat> we're going to do we're bed rest with head of bed elevated at 30%, um, 30 degrees, sorry about that. And 30 degrees is typically the, the magic number, right? For any kind of neurologic or um, like any kind of neuro uh, positioning, therapeutic positioning, 30 degrees is, is going to be good. It's going to decrease ICP. It's not going to, um, it's going to, uh, you know, prevent aspiration, et cetera, things like that. So again, droplet precautions for nurse and visitors. It's important to post a sign outside of the door on the door jam somewhere readily, readily visible and, you know, may, uh, preferably bright colors um, and just educate the family on how to do that. Put on the equipment on the outside of the room before you leave the room, take off the equipment and how to do that. Uh, we're going to probably initiate seizure pads. Uh, we're definitely going to want some suction equipment and emergency O2 at the bedside, right? especially if they've had seizure uh, activity, uh, you might do that. And if they've had seizure activity, we're going to go also on cardiac monitoring. So, um, you know, no more tongue blade or anything like that, but we're definitely going to want some suctioning equipment. Remember, if you're using a Yonkar suctioning device that you're not suctioning beyond what you can see. So don't blindly stick that device into the back of their throat and thinking you're going to, you know, be getting that uh, vomit or, or um, secretions better if you can't see it you're just you know kind of blindly stabbing back there all right so and and o2 right because we always worry about 
seizure uh, patients and when they they bite down really hard and they kind of cut off their own airway and, and they're not getting that oxygen. So we want a um, high flow two device at the bedside, something like a non rebreather or a bag valve mask or something. So let's go with something a little more obscure, but it is seen um, encephalitis. And we approach that the same way. Okay, so we're going to say, what is it? Uh, what causes it? How do we diagnose it? How do we treat it? How do we prevent it? You know, and how do we care for these patients in general? So it's inflammation of the brain tissue and often the surrounding meninges. So it's, again, it's not just um, meningitis, which is just affecting that three-layered meningeal tissue, right? That covering of the brain, um, the, the uh, arachnoid and dura mater and pia mater. But beyond that, actually into the brain parenchyma or brain tissue itself, um, it affects the cerebrum, brain stem, and cerebellum. So as you can see, the name indicates itis or inflammation of that brain tissue or that brain, <clears throat> uh, that brain parenchyma, uh, the brain stem and cerebellum. So if there's an inflammation in this, we know that the skull is rigid and unforgiving. There's no room for anything else besides that parenchyma. CSF that should be in its proper structures and blood. So as there's swelling, you know that there's going to be increased pressure. Um, might cause some neurological changes. I mean, this is things you should already be thinking about. Might cause some nausea, vomiting, some uh, cranial nerve, some um, personality issues, some neurological issues in general, right? Uh, it, so this travels to CN CNS or um, the CNS system via bloodstream along peripheral or cranial nerves. So what causes it? Virus. After virus invades the brain, it begins to reproduce, causing an inflammatory response. Uh, inflammation extends beyond cerebral cortex, the white matter and the meninges, causing degeneration of the neurons of the cortex. Demyelination of the axons occur due to white matter destruction and destruction then leads to hemorrhage edema and necrosis, and the development of small leucanae, which are small caverns or holes. Widespread edema can cause compression of blood vessels leading to further ICP. Death may occur from herniation and increased intracranial pressure. So what are the different types of microorganisms that can cause encephalitis? We got the arbor virus um, that can be transmitted through the bite of a mosquito or a tick. Uh, we, you know, we're going to consider the West Nile. Patients typically asymptomatic or flu-like symptoms. Uh, incubation is 2 to 15 days. The St. Louis encephalitis, California encephalitis, same contract um, contraction. It's uh, rare, severe, West Nile, which includes fever, vision loss, tremors, seizures, headache, fever, and decreased loss, uh, level of consciousness. There's an echovirus or Coxsackie virus, polio virus, and the herpes zoster. Uh, herpes simplex virus type 1 is most common non-epidemic non cause of encephalitis in North America. Patients usually report cold sores leading to contraction. And then there's the amoebic meningocephalitis, amoeba nigleria, and acanthamoeba found in warm fresh water entering nasal mucus of people swimming in lakes and ponds. So what are we assessing for? Typically, the patient with encephalitis reports high fevers with nausea, vomiting, and stiff neck. Hmm, sound like something else? Yeah, it does. So we got to look at some other differentiating um, criteria, uh, clinical presentation, because this can sound a lot like meningitis, right? Well, same. it's in the same area. It can cause very similar, um, you know, uh, kind of presentation. So so let's look for some some something classic or something that readily distinguishes this encephalitis from meningitis. So we have the stiff neck, we have fevers, we have nausea, vomiting, changes in mental status, agitation, or irritability, motor dysfunction, such as dysphagia, focal neurological deficits, uh, which, you know, makes sense, right? As we look at this, like, uh, A and P-wise, in terms of, let's say, there's some inflammation occurring in a particular part of the brain. So if there's pressure being exerted on that part of the brain that controls X part of the body, we'll see that focal neurological deficit. Uh, photophobia and phonophobia, fatigue, 
symptoms of increased ICP, uh, decreased level of consciousness, joint pain, which is not typical with meningitis, they're having the overall like joint pain, headaches, vertigo, uh, but we're going to assess it the same way in terms of level of consciousness using uh, Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, uh, we're going to look for the acute confusion, the irritability, personality, and behavior changes. We're going to assess for the nuchal rigidity and motor changes that range from mild weakness to hemiplegia, myelonic jerks, and increased deep tendon reflexes. We're going to observe for cranial nerve involvement, facial weakness, nystagmus, ocular paralysis. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Would you guys be wrong for uh, initiating uh, droplet precautions and isolation and uh, donning PPE until we can identify encephalitis versus meningitis in, in viral versus sterile versus uh, bacterial versus whatever? Not at all. You're definitely going to do this because, first of all, you don't want to become a victim yourself. Um, you're going to definitely you know, uh, institute those measures early. Uh, you're going to let someone know early. Obviously, that's the physician to let them know that, you know, some neurological changes have occurred or your suspicions are, you know, just like the uh, SBAR format. We're going to get down to the arm. We're going to recommend, man, this guy's, doc, this guy's really presenting symptomatically pretty classic uh, like meningitis. You know, I mean, even if you kind of, dump encephalitis in general who cares for all intents and purposes to you it seems like meningitis they're going to do a csf and and all that other stuff as we'll see in the next slide so um until they rule all that out let's make sure that we protect ourselves protect our nursing team protect our healthcare team and of course protect all those at home that we're we're bringing our dirty scrubs back to right so just like i mentioned uh just a second ago how do we diagnose this uh, we're going to do an LP or lumbar puncture, right, done to analyze the CSF. Um, polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, to detect viral DNA, ribonucleic acid, RNA, and CSF. Specificity and sensitivity is excellent. Replaces brain tissue biopsy with non-invasive rapid test. Electroencephalophagram to evaluate brainwave activity. CT brain with or without contrast to eval ICP and obstructive hydrocephalus. Of course, we're going to do a CT brain when someone comes in um, altered or they're having neurological um, deficits of some sort or changes. Uh, we're most likely going to start in the ER with a CT brain without and then, you know, do further testing as we as we kind of pinpoint or, or um, evaluate this individual more more readily. Uh, so how are we caring for this patient pre and post LP? So if you've pushed pause and kind of looked up that that LP pre and post procedure, you're going to see that you're going to want to explain the procedure, noting that some discomfort may be felt when local anesthetic is injected or that pain may occur in legs when spinal need needle is inserted. So how many knew that, that you would have pain that radiates down to the legs when you're tapping into the spine and all the nerves, 31 nerves innervate um, from that column and, you know, it's something's going to occur, right? Uh, and risks, um, but you you know you you're not discussing the risks and benefits of the procedure. That would be the doctor. If this patient looks like they're absolutely lost and have too many questions, what should we do? That's correct. We're going to go get the doctor again. Say, hey, doctor, Doctor Martinez, or Doctor Yan, um, you know, Mrs. Smith in room 21. She doesn't. Uh, she has way too many questions, and it's more. It's you know, beyond my pay grade. Can you go ahead and square her away with that knowledge? And then uh, maybe have her resign that um, uh, consent to treat form. Uh, we're going to place the patient in the fetal position and remain, uh, remind him or her to remain still. Uh, if needed, keep patient from moving. Uh, sometimes people opt to do, uh, well, that's the preferred method, but some people opt to do the um, sitting up with the rounded back and leaning over like a bedside table or mayo stand with a pillow and um, you know, kind of the sitting up position, but this is the most uh, common uh, positioning for this procedure. We're going to complete neuro exams post-op and, um, and vital signs. We're going to keep the patient flat one hour post-LP. So if they got to get up and go to use the restroom, guess what? Um, fracture pan or bed pan, right? Or whatever it is. So we're going to do more. You just tell them, go ahead and, you know, wet the bed. I've already put down 
um, incontinent pads there. So I'll clean you up. Don't worry. It's just important that we keep you flat for the first hour post procedure. Um, encourage increase of fluid intake. Assess for headache, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, and le level of consciousness change. Uh, look for leakage around the site. Um, you know. So how are we treating encephalitis? A cyclovir is an antiviral drug of choice for herpes encephalitis. It's most effective if begun early before a decline in level of consciousness. Neural decline usually occurs four to six days after initial neural symptoms begin. You know, as we look at um, antivirals more, as we learn about them more, you notice that um, a lot of the stuff for these viral things, they really have to pass kind of on their own. But we do have a, 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 just a handful of antivirals, really, and they should be used responsibly because we've we've you know over time uh, acted really irresponsibly with antibiotic therapy and rendered some of them very useless and we've had to create new and more effective and stronger ones um so i really we're very we're very uh, con conservative when it comes to um using antiviral therapy a lot of times just like tamiflu like tamiflu will even say plain as day if you don't start it early in the first couple of days of symptomatic presentation it's it basically has to kind of pass on its own. They may still prescribe it, you may still use it, but whether it was effective and whether it wasn't just your own body kind of taking its course and doing what it has to do, that, you know, there's no way to tell for sure. But for sure, if it started early, it can definitely help speed up the process. The interventions are similar for meningitis in terms of uh, supportive care, uh, nursing care and prompt recognition of increased ICP. Of course, we're gonna measure that at the bedside through our um, Glasgow Coma Scale and our GCS Scale. We're going to maintain patent airway, always ABCs, right? We're going to assess vital signs and neuro assessment, Q2 hours or PRN. Elevate the head of the bed to how many degrees? That's correct, 30 degrees, okay? We're going to keep the room dark and quiet, and we're going to use standard precautions. All right, so that concludes the lecture. Um, thank you for joining me again. Uh, look this over, um, look up those meds that I mentioned in the PowerPoint. Look at that uh, post-op uh, LP, um, you know, classic presentation and, and diagnostics of um, meningitis uh, sterile or um, viral versus the bacterial and versus the obscure protozoal and, and, and other things. Um, yeah, that's it, guys. So thank you again for joining me.